Dan se, Sylvia Weenie and Sihka Sun. I'm the chief of uh, Stony Knoll, but I reside in uh, Sweetgrass First Nation. And I'm a direct descendant of uh, Chief Strike Amanabak. And currently I am working as uh, a consultant for uh, language and cultural teachings. Dance, Pamela Peterson, Sihka Sun, Sweetgrass Virginia. I am the Healthy Families Program Director at Bell River Treaty 6 and my life's passion is early childhood education. One of the things that uh, I was told, and I know, um, got to know this very well, is uh, children are the most precious gifts that are loaned to us from the Creator. And that is one of the things that uh, was drilled into, uh, drilled into me uh, when I became a mom and uh, I had to learn about traditional uh, parenting from my mother-in-law and because I am a product of the residential school and so was my uh, my parents and my grandparents so I'm a third generation residential school bus survivor so a lot of these things I had to learn from uh, my uh, my mother-in-law and she was not uh, a part of the the dark the dark uh, history that we uh, we went through as uh, a nation and a lot of my teachings uh, stem from from her side and that is one of the things that she really instilled in me is um, that our children are the greatest gifts that you will ever receive here on earth and that's uh, a gift from the Creator and all the things that we need to do to, um, to really honor the child. All the teachings that the, she, uh, that I practiced later on in life with all of my children are a part of her teachings, plus my, my grandma, uh, grandmother on that side as well. So um, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Uh. Well, I think just to echo um, what um, she just shared is that growing up, I was, um, I seen everything that she is just talking about with my my kukum on my on my late dad's side and seeing her um, gentleness how she approached um, us as the children um, and taking that as I as I grew up and to be to be a mother and to apply what knowledge she shared with me through her mentoring even though she didn't um, say oh, okay come watch me you know do this but just watching and observing and seeing how she handled um, the child, the child raising, the child rearing, uh, you know, to always be kind with the, um, with the, with the child, always be, you know, to watch that soft spot, to, um, to be mindful of how you, how you handle that baby, how you handle that small child as they, you know, as they, as they mature, to know that um, they're truly precious and they're a gift. And I know sometimes um, that word is overused, mm -hmm. but to truly, to truly honor that, um, even to um, how discipline was done from her side versus um, on the other side of my on my family, um, it was very it was very different. I never heard my late um, Gukum ever raise her voice. It was always gentle, a gentle, um, soft. Um, voice but you knew when she was serious you knew when um, when to listen and it was just the approach that she used that um, it different it was different than on the other side where I saw as an adult now I recognized that it was the um, the effects of the um, residential school and their upbringing and what they saw so it is like the children are are truly a gift and to um to nurture that as i saw my mom parent my grandparents parent i my goal is to in turn to do that to my own children and even as old as my children are you know 20 and 16 i still try to use those approaches of um of kindness i guess to be stern but with my voice not yelling but just stern okay this is how it is you know can either go this way and that way and that was something that my late dad really um, practiced with us was um, we never heard him yell either 
but you knew when you know things were serious and to sit you down and to um to have those conversations with you and he would always say you know what you can always go this way but here are the consequences this is what the consequences would look like or you can go this way and these would be the consequences of that of, of those choices as well but ultimately it's up to you I can only guide you so to have those approaches be you know brought back into um into those child in, into child rearing I think is really important because the roles that we play in our communities we see um, the teachings not um, I guess dormant mm. those traditional teachings dormant mm. and to bring those back and to use our voices um, to educate to educate the young moms or even the moms now that are you know you know have the children already so um, my goal is to is to bring back bring back those teachings and to um, bring them up to the the, the surface again mm -hmm. and to reclaim them mm -hmm. to re reclaim them and to empower our our young parents mm -hmm. so that they're able to um, to honor that child One of the first things that I would um, I would really love to see from my from uh, my opinion is uh, we need to have um, more uh, traditional parenting mm -hmm. in in the communities because I know there's um, there's a big cry for that right now and uh, as I get older I see more and more young women approaching me for uh, information and and things like that not just. Uh, not just the uh, young women, but there's also teachers that are wanting to uh, to have that brought into the schools where the the young the young girls, 12 and you know 12 year old and older, uh, to be taught the um, the roles that uh, that they would play within within our society, you know, uh, bringing up uh, our children, our future uh, children, and and whatnot. So um, these are some of the some of the ways that uh, we can definitely look at uh, bringing in uh, traditional parenting, uh, bringing in elders to uh, to come and uh, model, to come and uh, share stories with our young people, mm -hmm. because I know that's how I learned. That's how I learned. It was my mother-in-law that had modeled mm -hmm. the uh, the ways for me. And like she said, uh, she didn't tell me this is how it's done, mm -hmm. but she modeled for me. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, that's the best way our young people learn is mm -hmm. um, not to be told, but to be uh, to model for them, and to model a good uh, uh, parenting skills. They would pick that up uh, immediately. One of the things that uh, uh, we talked about was uh, mm, moss bag teachings. Mm -hmm. She taught me so much about the moss bag. She taught me stories about it, like she told me stories about it and the benefits that uh, it had. But uh, one of the things that uh, I would, um, that I came to realize later on is all the benefits that she talked about from a moss bag. Later on, um, somebody showed me an article that the, uh, the scientists and, and um, different academics were, um, studying about the benefits of the moss bag and they were just really uh, really uh, surprised to see all the, the beneficial things that you can get uh, from using a moss bag and I have seen that um, I have seen uh, evidence of that mm -hmm. where um, there was uh, a woman that came she used to work at the Bandoffs and she had a real colicky baby it was her first baby, and uh, and she was a Munya squirrel that came in to do the finances at the Banoffs, and then uh, she had her baby, and about a month down the line, the girls went to visit her, and she was complaining that her baby just wouldn't sleep, wouldn't sleep in the colicky. And they showed her, they showed her the moss bag. The next, uh, they went to visit her, took a moss bag for her, taught her how to use it, and uh, she couldn't believe it. She couldn't believe it. That was the first time since bringing her baby home that uh, she was able to have a full a full night's uh, rest. And uh, and these are things that were general practice. Like th those were common practices in in our history. 
and um, and these are the things that we need to pass down because they're they're of value, you know. And our people need to know the things that we um, contributed to uh, to the world. They're value. They're of value, and I think a lot of these things need to be. Uh, we need to take more focus on on um, all the good things that have been, uh, you know, shared to the the general public by the First Nations people, and to instill that pride within uh, our um, our nations, and and in terms of um, of. Uh, um, traditional parenting. I think uh, there's so many there's so many stories that are out there, and we just need to go out there and seek them out from the from the elders. The elders are sitting at home waiting to be asked, you know, to come and share share their uh, their teachings. And that's one of the things that um, I would really recommend for people to do is. Uh, to go and seek out your elders, bring them out, and uh, share stories with them, mm -hmm. and um, you would, you'd be surprised with all the knowledge that they, they carry, mm -hmm. and the whole world can benefit from, from our our kukums mm -hmm. in our communities. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you want to add any more to that. Well, <coughs> I think in the aspect of um, ECE and what, how they can, I guess benefit is to um, really engulf, really engulf in um, those teachings, mm -hmm. engulf them themselves. The programming mm -hmm. needs to be, I feel, um, saturated, mm -hmm. saturated with our language, culture, our teachings, mm -hmm. um, to have that gukum, mm -hmm. you know, as a full-time employee, to have those knowledge keepers as a full-time employee, to mentor, like you said, what you know? What about the ones that aren't in? You know, um, didn't grow up with the culture, don't have those teachings. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Let's let's bring the people into the programming that do have those teachings. Mm -hmm. You know, if we're able to do that in these other uh, academic programming, why why not in the ECE program? Mm -hmm. Make that part of um, the daily program, the daily, you know, the um, events that happen. Make that make those stakeholders the key people that um, help us, um, I guess, surround our children with what um, we were brought up with, mm -hmm. the traditional teachings, all of those things that were mentioned here, like from the moss bag, right from the moss bag, the soft spot, the belly button, the naming. Mm -hmm. You have young people that are um, wanting, wanting rich, they want, they want that um, knowledge, but they just don't know how to seek it. Mm -hmm. So if we have those resources available right in the daycare and the Head Start mm -hmm. and show them how to access them, show them, you know, what protocol is, how to approach an elder, you know, what to give them, what to offer them and ask, you know, what are you, what are you seeking? Oh, I want to, I want a spirit name for my child. Okay, so this is how we, how we do it, mm -hmm. you know, and help them prepare. I guess addressing those barriers of, um, those for those resources so our families can access those resources mm -hmm. and not to um, shame not to have shame mm -hmm. for not knowing mm -hmm. so to have those healthy elders you know available have the healthy knowledge keepers um, and create those safe environments for everyone to learn everyone because really we're all there for the child we're all there for the children mm -hmm. that's our future mm -hmm. So that's how I feel that um, an ECE environment should look mm -hmm. and the ECE um, employees mm -hmm. um, to be prepared to be, um, have an open heart, an open mind, mm -hmm. to be ready to accept um, knowledge and to in, in turn share that with the children. So that's, that's my goal is to see, um, to see that with our ECE environments. So one of the things that uh, I will, uh, that is one of the, uh, the biggest things with my, uh, with my life at this point, because of the fact that I'm a residential school survivor, um, they tried to uh, erase my language, my identity, my culture from me. But language was the biggest, the biggest thing. And language was the thing that, uh, that helped 
that helped me get back what uh, what was missing within my spirit and I had made it my life's uh, work it seems to try and instill that language back into the the young people I've worked within the uh, the school system for over 50 years and that's one of my my things that I'm doing right now in the last 20 years is just uh, building curriculum and just building uh, different methods for the children to uh, to get the language because I know um, a lot of our young people don't speak the language and it's getting harder and harder to find fluent speakers to pass down that, uh, that language and I worked with um, schools where the majority of the teachers are non uh, Cree speakers and they would love to to get the language but they don't they didn't know how to go about it in order to help uh, their students learn the language and when I brainstormed with them uh, what they wanted was um, they wanted to hear the language they wanted to hear it over and over again so they would become more at ease in bringing it out and, and using it and um, that's what I'm working on right now and I'm working on a curriculum and a program that's for uh, daycare. It starts right at daycare and um, Head Start, preschool, kindergarten, right up to grade three. And we're implementing that uh, this fall. And that's, um, and that's how um, it's uh, structured. It's all um, oral. Mm. And the, uh, the workers may not know the language, but it's, um, it's structured in such a way that uh, you listen to the, the, the words on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And not just them, but the, the children will take the, those words home as well. And what I'm developing right now, you can access it right on uh, um, the computer. And that's why I love technology. Mm -hmm. As old as I am, like mm -hmm. technology and uh, the traditional teaching, they, they work hand in hand right now in order to revive the language. Eh? So that's what, um, that's what I've been doing. And there's um, audio books that I'm, I'm making right now that's, uh, that are geared for uh, uh, daycare, uh, Head Start, and uh, the, young, the young children right up to grade three right now. And that's what we're um, implementing this fall. And anybody, anybody that has uh, access to a computer can tap into the, uh, the resources that are on there. And it's all oral and, um, and it's local. It's all local. The pictures that are, that are used in there, the storylines and, and whatever you, however you want to uh, have it. Mm -hmm. You can develop your own, uh, develop your own materials mm -hmm. and just as long as you give out that oral piece to it because that's what uh, that's what the teachers are wanting that's what the workers are wanting and that's what the children really they really thrive on uh, listening listening to um, to the the oral language mm -hmm. and they love to mimic they love mm -hmm. to mimic uh, how the words are said mm -hmm. and I'm starting to hear more of the language when I go to the school or when I go to uh, community events yeah. the children just um, uh, saying, you know, a single word here and there, but it's there, it's coming. Yeah. And if we can get more of the people uh, to do that and more of the, uh, the young parents to do that and, and try and get it uh, going within, uh, within uh, the homes as well, it's going to, uh, it's going to come alive, you know, a lot sooner than, uh, than I had an anticipated because of the results that I've seen so far. So I'm excited about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know for um, like how to immerse language in the, in the programming, there's like she was saying, like technology is amazing and there's no excuse for us not to be able to access mm -hmm. technology. Mm -hmm. um, for example, like YouTube, mm -hmm. there's amazing, amazing um, um, resources on there. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to go back to something as simple as lullabies. Mm -hmm. 
to me, that's what I, oh, okay, lullaby, yeah, mm -hmm, you know, come, you know, my son, I'm going to sing you the sleeping song, you know. But I was repeating what I was, how I was sung to by my gugam. Mm -hmm. And after finding out, um, there was another person who reached out to us and said, I reached out to your late mother-in-law and I asked if I can um, use her lullaby because it was, you know, how many, how many generations old and I made a CD with your late, your late mother-in-law's um, lullabies on there. And um, so that sparked a conversation between her, um, her and I and she said, you know what, lullabies were more than just lullabies. When you sung a lullaby to your child, you're, you were giving, um, your child was hearing every syllable in the Cree language through those mm -hmm. lullabies. They may not have sounded or made sense to the, you know, ears today, mm -hmm. but every syllable that was sung mm -hmm. had those, every, you know, syllable in the Cree language. Mm -hmm. So already exposure mm -hmm. to the sounds of our language in those lullabies. Mm -hmm. Like how powerful is that? You know, th you're thinking you're just trying to soothe your child yeah. to sleep or whatever, but you're you're um, gifting them with the language already. Mm -hmm. So I was just like, hey, I need CDs, I need CDs <laughs> to share them with, um, you know, the ECE fam um, workers that Head Start, mm -hmm. um, our families, and to um, empower them, to let them know that story, to let them know that it's more than just a lullaby. It was gifting your child with the, with the, I guess this planting those seeds of the language. Mm -hmm. So that's another way of um, how I wish to incorporate is to empower our families to know that our practices, our traditional practices, mm -hmm. were, are way more than what they appear to be mm -hmm. as simple as that lullaby. Mm -hmm. Well, in my opinion, <laughs> It's like some, somewhere along the timeline of our people, we got stuck in that colonial thinking mm -hmm. and that curriculum thinking like, okay, nine o'clock to 9.30 is circle time. Mm -hmm. 9.30 to, mm -hmm. you know, this time is structured play. Mm -hmm. This time we're gonna go play with our math centers. Mm -hmm. This time we're gonna go play with our social studies mm -hmm. or, you know, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And it's like, we have a hard time tra transitioning back to what it was naturally, mm -hmm. natural play. And now that's the big term that you hear in ECE, yeah. <laughs> natural play, loose parts. Mm -hmm. Well, to me, that was how I grew up. <laughs> so it's like we're stuck in that colonial thinking and we're trying to um, mimic, we're trying to mimic a system that wasn't meant for us. That's not how we naturally learned. That's mm -hmm. not how we were um, raised. So trying to fit our, our programming it, to fit, to, to mimic that system. It just doesn't make sense to me that this is something that we're trying to um, to do. And then we sit back and say, well, why is, you know, how come this is, our numbers are low or this is happening or learning is not, because it's not natural. Mm -hmm. To me, land base, this is where, this is us. This is, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it just makes sense to go back to the land, feed our spirits, you know, put your, put your feet on the, on the ground. I remember, you know, mm -hmm. Even as old as I am, my mom's saying, Kate, if we're at a feast or whatever, outdoor, take your shoes off, touch the ground. Let your feet touch the ground, ground yourself. Think about our ancestors that have roamed here hundreds and hundreds of years ago before we're sitting here and we're having a feast. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's what's missing is that um, spiritual component mm -hmm. of, of mm -hmm. structured play versus land-based learning mm -hmm. so to me it's like we're we got stuck there somehow and it's as if we're trying to convince ourselves okay let's go to land-based learning well that's yeah that's what it that's who we are as people mm -hmm. so to have our children you know nurtured in that um that in that natural environment it just makes sense mm -hmm. see one of the things that um Land-based learning seems to be the buzzword in education in the last uh, maybe eight years or so. And uh, a lot of times I see, I go around to different schools and I see land-based learning within the school systems missing the point. Mm. And uh, 
you know, we need to step back as educators and really, um, really look at what is truly meant by land-based learning. Mm -hmm. To me, land-based learning is taking my children out and teaching them about the rock, you know, and then just telling them stories about the rocks because this really affects our children. Even in grade, um, grade five, I believe, the teacher came to me one time and wanted, uh, wanted some feedback on, uh, I want you to come into my classroom and I want you to explain the difference between the Western worldview and the indigenous worldview on, uh, on rocks mm -hmm. because there's an argument going on in my classroom. And um, the indigenous children are saying, no, the rock is alive. Whereas the other half was saying, no, it's not. Like, you know, from the Western side, no, it's not. Like, and there was a big controversy about that. So I had to go in and I had to tell them, you know, there's different worldviews. Mm -hmm. And from our worldview, everything is alive. Mm -hmm. We're connected. Mm -hmm. And it all stems right back to uh, our uh, creation story. Mm -hmm. And everything, everything that we do stems right back to creation story. And it also teaches, land-based learning also teaches, like she said, the spiritual component of everything. You look around, you know, and I have, though that grass there has as much life, you know, um, we need to give it that kind of respect mm -hmm. that, we, that I would give a, a human being. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't go over there and be plucking the, the grass out of, you know, out of, out of the ground for no reason. And, uh, and we need to model these things. We need to model because the children always watch, eh? They're always watching. And we need to pay respect to uh, all the different things around us. That's one of the key things that, uh, that's missing too in our, in our school systems. And it just, everything stems right back, like I said, to, um, to um, our creation story how we need to show respect. Mm -hmm. If you go back to our creation story, we, um, everything else was created before man. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were the last ones that were created. And, but we need to, we seem to be the most needy of all creation, you know? And we need to, uh, when we teach that to our children, it also teaches them hum humbleness. And then you go right into the teepee, like in you know, all the different the different values that you need to uh, be uh, instilling within our our, uh, our children. And there's so much there's so much that you can learn from the from the land itself. And you can you can probably teach teach different themes and different uh, different things from the land because the land was actually our very first classroom and it continues to be so but um, for some reason we boxed our uh, our children mm -hmm. in a square classroom and expect them to learn mm -hmm. empathy we expect them to learn you know the wonders of the world mm -hmm. how can they we need to bring them out where there where there's freedom mm -hmm. freedom for them to expand their their thinking mm -hmm. their cognitive development and mm -hmm. their um, you know, their exploration. We need to, we need to nurture all of these things. Mm -hmm. The more we do that, the better it is for, for them as they, as they grow up. You know, it becomes, uh, they become more grounded because they, they become, they become knowledgeable as to who they are and where they belong on Mother Earth. Mm -hmm. You know, and, um, and I don't think you can rightfully do that, um, in a strong way in a classroom. Mm -hmm. You need to bring them out and you need to, uh, they need to explore. They need to explore the world around them mm -hmm. to, find, to find where they belong mm -hmm. in the universe, within the universe. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and it starts right from the time that they're young, mm -hmm. when they're babies. Mm -hmm. that, that I would incorporate that with your land base mm -hmm. because, yeah. uh, because uh, like she, she mentioned earlier, the, the spiritual component is missing with our uh, program, land-based programming out there. And the natural law would definitely be a part of that. Eh? Mm -hmm. 
that was one of the things that our elders long time ago used to teach us, you know, right from the time we were small, um, not to be mean to uh, other creations. You know, they have as much right to be here as you and me, and and you need to respect. You need to respect uh, all of creation. Mm -hmm. And that starts right back to uh, the creation story, right mm -hmm. back to how we treat one another, you know. So, um, that's that's one way of uh, incorporating it, the teachings into that. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I think it just makes sense that um, if you're out on the land naturally, yeah. mm -hmm. even in her story about the rocks, yeah. like that's natural law right there. Like mm -hmm. to have respect for yeah. for um, for the rock, mm -hmm. like you know, live and not, you know mm -hmm. that that whole question of you know inanimate and animate. And, um, you know, that respect. So right there is natural law. Mm -hmm. If you're out on the land doing the things um, on the land and you have those guides to help you, mm -hmm. like the elders and the knowledge, mm -hmm. knowledge keepers, those teachings just come naturally. Mm -hmm. So to um, have those healthy people that, are, um, that have that knowledge to be prepared to, um, to do that teaching naturally, it just, it's just natural, like, to yeah. be, mm -hmm. you know, with your kukum and she's berry picking. Or I remember growing up, and being um, being on the land, I don't know what she was doing. Just kidding. She was probably I don't know what she was doing, but picking flowers and thinking, oh, I'm gonna pick these for my kukam, You know, no, you don't touch anything. You never know what you're touching. Could be poisonous. You you never know. And to have respect for that plant, if you don't have a purpose for picking it, don't touch it. So things like that. It's like natural. It was a natural law that was always being taught throughout um, throughout everyday activities. Mm -hmm. So taking that time and um, investing, investing um, that knowledge transfer, I guess, mm -hmm. would, would be, mm -hmm. rather than just scolding that child. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it just comes natural, mm -hmm. you know, when you're in the environment. It, there's always an opportunity to, um, to share those teachings, to share that knowledge. Gosh, in a perfect world, what would ECE look like? Mm -hmm. Honestly, for our First Nations children, I really do believe that it needs to be um, go back, go back to um, where the elders lead the programming, mm. where the l elders lead the programming and are guiding the workers, mm -hmm. guiding the ECE workers um, as to what programming should look like. If you want to stick that word programming. Mm -hmm. But it really, that's where I feel it needs to go back to, is that we're taking the um, lead from the elders, the elders and the ones that um, have raised their children in a traditional, in a traditional way. A traditional way and also using language. Like, we need to um, really encompass our children around um, those strong pillars I'm going to say and that's culture language um, the teachings because we're building the foundation like that's such a like from zero to six was the age yesterday that we discussed mm -hmm. to me that's where that's where it needs to happen is let's let's start let's start um, building and solidifying that foundation mm -hmm. because once they know who they are and where they come from yeah. to me they can live um, in any environment. So whether it's on their First Nation or if they need to go out mm -hmm. into these different environments, they're always going to know their identity. Mm -hmm. And that's, they'll never be lost. Mm -hmm. They'll never be lost. They know their identity and where they come from, where their roots are, their teachings. Mm -hmm. So that would be my goal. That would be my goal is to um, ensure that our programs are led by our, our elders our elders and are surrounded by the stakeholders of the community. And those would be the knowledge keepers. And like I said, the parents that have you know, raised their children traditionally that they could come share their teachings with, um, with the workers there, the parents, and just like hug our children with everything that they would need to be success, su successful in, um, in society. Mm -hmm. So no matter where they are in the world, mm -hmm. they'll know where they come from. I actually coached her to say that. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> no, uh, one of the biggest things that um, I want to, I can't stress it, uh, you know, strong enough, but uh, one of the uh, foundations of being who you are is your language mm. that um, stems right into your, um, your identity, your, um, your ceremony, everything, everything about you. It's, um, it's your uh, language that, you know, sets the tone and, and that's why uh, I believe that uh, elders need to be a big part of uh, the children, need to be a big part of our children in the community and also with our, the parenting skills. They need to be a big part of um, the parenting, transferring that knowledge, that knowledge down to their um, um, the young people, the young people of the community, to make sure that uh, the teachings stay alive, the teachings keep uh, being passed down to the next generation. We need to do. Uh, we need to do that because I think we owe it to our ancestors. They've worked, you know, hard for us to be here today, and I think um, we owe it to them that uh, we need to pass down their cultural teachings, their um, parenting skills and everything that's important to the First Nations person, uh, we need to um, pass those down to the next generation and keep it going, keep our nation strong and healthy. Mm -hmm. so. I just want to say it's been a very humbling experience to be part of this, to be part of this, um, this, uh, these past two days and to be sitting at the table and listening to the, um, all the knowledge and information um, being shared for um, all the courage and bravery, for all the um, vulnerability. Because mm -hmm. um, really it's our children that are gonna win. Mm -hmm. And to uh, what came to mind was hearing like, oh my gosh, you know, I have so much work ahead of me because look, I'm learning so much from all these other speakers and okay, well, I need to go and do this with you know my community. But as I sit here and you say, oh, you know, is there some last words that you wanna, it's, going back to that communal thinking mm -hmm. that's what it is mm -hmm. because like i said for some reason we've switched to that silo like we're just silo mm -hmm. siloed thinking siloed program siloed this 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 and as if competing for you know numbers dollars um it's like taking a step back really reevaluating why we're in 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 the programs or in the jobs that we're you know in and for me, it's like connecting, connecting all those resources and really surrounding the children and the families um, with those, accessing those services and resources. And to me, SIT is on the right path, on the right path to um, really blowing it up and opening everything and having those conversations and realizing, oh my gosh, we have still a lot, a lot of work to do. But that's good because we're all now going to be focusing in the same direction is that you know trying to um, surround that child with what they need mm -hmm. to be grounded to be to um, plant those seeds that they're able to um, flourish in this world well i am really thankful for um, siit <laughs> for uh, for all that they're doing and uh, it is um, greatly needed in our communities mm -hmm. not just around here but i think uh, provincially there's uh, a big call out for uh, for Indigenous uh, teachings, par uh, parent, uh, parental uh, teachings, and the use of elders, and getting them in to uh, come and do their their teachings within the the various communities that we have surrounding our our areas here. So, intro scene, take one. I reside in uh, Sweetgrass First Nation, and I am um, the. I forget who I am. <laughs> Someone please remind me. Who am I? Oh, I want to do another one. Just wait, sorry. Uh, another one. <laughs> I'm the healthy family. <laughs> Did you hear me? Healthy family. Dance. Pamela Peterson Nitsiasen. Okay, you need to quit laughing, Mom. I can see you. Jiggling on my eye peripheral. <laughs> Go for it. Just 
wait, wait, I'll get it yet. I'll know who I am yet. Dance. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Sylvia and Pam show. Let's give them a round of applause. I'm like, why is this so hard? <laughs> 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 Separate them. Right? <laughs> this one here, she has the giggles. <laughs> <laughs>